Why don't we uh, begin praying? Fathers, we gather under your word. We understand the seriousness of opening up your word together and submitting our lives to it. So God, we ask that you would speak to us this morning from your word, that you would challenge us, that you would confront us, that you would guide us, that you'd direct us, that you'd lead us. It's in the name of Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. I'm not sure if any of you are <clears throat> literature fans. Um, I dabble. I'm not much of an expert, but I dabble in literature. One of the books that um, I really loved was written in the 20s by Aldous Huxley. It's called Brave New World. If you, in high school, had to read George Orwell's 1984, Aldous Huxley was George Orwell's teacher. And uh, the legend says that George Orwell wrote 1984 in response to Aldous Huxley's Brave New World and his dystopic vision of how the world was going to continue into the future. And basically, Aldous Huxley's point throughout the entire book, he talks about this world, and it's a world where everyone has whatever they would like to have. They've been able to free the world entirely from any kind of moral constraint. So they've separated sexuality from procreation. So whoever you'd like to have sexual relations with, you do it however you'd like, whenever you'd like, at any given moment. They've got movie theaters that have these handlebars in the movie theaters that you can experience everything that you're seeing on the screen. And whatever pleasure is happening on the screen, you feel it and you sense it also. And if you just happen to be having a day that's not as good as all the other days, you can take a little pill that's called a Soma pill, and that pill just fills your body with absolutely all the pleasure that you could imagine. And Aldous Huxley's point throughout the entire book is that basically, because people are so full of pleasure, they don't actually care about truth. Because they're so full of everything that they can imagine, they don't care what the government is doing. They don't care about properly interpreting history. They don't care about the profound questions in terms of the meaning of life. The only thing that they care about is the next shot of pleasure. And even though we don't live in a world that's exactly the same, I don't think that we're too far off. In America, we find ourselves in a little bit of a crisis. I think we could call it an existential crisis. And the fact that we don't know why we exist. By and large, we tend to think that we exist just to experience pleasure. Now, we might not experience pleasure the way Aldous Huxley talks about it, but in particular, we have, famili we have families who have achieved what this world would consider perfect happiness. They have successful businesses, complete, full, healthy families, bank accounts that are brimming over. Instagram is full of experiences and trips that they've had. And yet, by and large, we're emptier than ever. And yet, there's this still deep, and I mean deep brokenness in our world to which we are becoming more and more numb. All the recent studies show that depression and anxiety are on the rise in the United States. As a society, more and more every decade, and with more and more accomplishments, we end up being more and more disappointed with our lives. No matter what we create technologically, how we advance tech economically, we can't seem to stop violence. We can't seem to deter racism. We can't seem to stop race terrorism. We can't stop abuse. We can't stop poverty. We have a government that's highly polarized. If I just say the name Brett Kavanaugh, all of you feel something? I'm not telling you what to feel. The world continues, right? Really bad things, like Ben Affleck and Jennifer Gardner getting divorced. What is the world coming to? The very best that we can do, often, is ignore, or at the very least delay, having to answer the very meaningful questions. We can delay it by being successful. We can delay the really meaningful questions by being with family, focusing on exercise or self-help or any other 
any other number of issues, but at some point and at some moment, everything comes crashing down for every person. At some point, we have to ask the question, why am I even here? It might be illness. It might be the loss of a loved one. It might be your business just falling apart. It might be any other other number of things, but at some point, the wonderful little bubble that we've called the American dream pops. And we have to ask ourselves the question, really, is that all life is about? Is that really why I'm here? House, white picket fence, two cars, two and a half children, is this the epitome of my existence? Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor, wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning, and he says, those who have a why to live can face almost any how. Those who know why they exist can face any kind of circumstance. And when we talk about the gospel, when we talk about the message that Christians believe, we're not just talking about a message that frees me from hell and gets me into heaven. We're talking about a message that answers the deepest, most fundamental questions that every single human being has. And the story begins in Genesis 1. And what we discover throughout the entire storyline of the Bible is the following. We were designed to be in and enjoy God's perfect presence. We were designed to be in and enjoy God's perfect presence. The story of our Bible begins at creation where we see this perfect presence explaining how it is that God created the world, and with just the power of his voice, he speaks. And we see beautiful scenery that's created. With the power of his voice, he speaks, and everything that man and woman could possibly need is present within the garden. He speaks, and light exists. He speaks, and animals exist. With the power of his voice, he prepares a perfect abode for Adam and Eve to exist and enjoy his presence forever. Before they even exist, God has taken care of man. Man doesn't have to go searching for food. He has everything that he needs because God has provided it. But in Genesis 1, truly the best thing that God has given to humanity is not the creation. The best thing that God has given to humanity is the opportunity to always be in God's perfect presence. We know that God descended to walk with Adam and Eve in the garden They depended on God. They related with God. They lived their lives constantly in his presence. And the special thing about man is that God made us in his image. He designed us to reflect to the world everything that God is, to reflect love, his creativity, his goodness, his intimacy, his community. Man was designed to walk with God and to be like God. And this relationship that man has with God in the Garden of Eden is built on top of a covenant. And the covenant is very simple. I will give you my presence. I've given you this garden, everything that you could possibly need. And there's one condition. And the only condition is that you depend on me for right and wrong, and you don't go eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You depend on me, you trust in me, and everything goes according to plan. However, (laughs) it took us only two chapters to ruin everything. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent came to the woman, lied, and got her, deceived her and Adam, who was standing right next to her, to eat of the fruit that was forbidden. Deceived in their hearts, they decided to eat the fruit, believing that they didn't need God. God designed them to be in and enjoy his presence forever. And the center of the lie that the serpent fed Adam and Eve was that they didn't actually need God. How wrong they were 
In that very moment, their eyes were opened. They felt shame for the first time. They felt guilt for the very first time. They realized that they were naked for the very first time. And with this decision, they plunged all of humanity into evil and sin. And it's interesting to see what Genesis 3 verse 8 says about how they responded to their sin. In Genesis 3, 8, it says, And they heard God walking in the garden during the fresh of the day, and man and woman hid from the presence of God. Made and designed to be in and enjoy his presence forever. Sin enters, and how does man respond? They hide from the presence of God. There's a lot of interesting things in this passage. It's interesting that God, knowing that they failed, comes and looks for them. God comes seeking them. Adam and Eve, deep down, know that they can't be in God's perfect presence the way that they are. It isn't possible. Only someone who's perfectly pure, exactly the way God made them, can be in God's presence. Sin can't be in God's presence. The same perfect, pure, and just presence of God will consume and destroy the sinner. So Adam and Eve hide from God's presence. And instead of destroying Adam and Eve, God kills an animal and he covers them. And everything changes. We were made to be in and enjoy God's presence forever. But in that moment, in the moment of the fall, we lose God's perfect presence God sends Adam and Eve out of the garden, what he created for them to enjoy his presence. Man can no longer be in God's perfect presence. They've committed treason. If they were to remain in God's presence, God's perfect holiness would consume them. And the Bible tells us that in Adam, all men died. In Adam, every human being that is born is born under the curse of being separated from God. And what's interesting about the story of the Bible is that it could very easily end right there. God could say, you know what, that was a good little fun little project, but clearly it didn't go very well, so we're just going to start over. But that's not what happened, right? God sovereignly decides that he's going to pursue Adam and Eve, he's going to pursue humanity. God initiates, despite the fact that we are rebellious and we want the world our way and we want it to revolve around us, God is gracious and patient and creates a way for us to be with him again. And from Genesis 3, throughout the rest of the story of the Bible, what we're hearing is the story of how God is rescuing, redeeming, and reconciling all things. Specifically, how God is seeking man to reconcile man with himself. God is the central character of the Scriptures. This is very important. You're not the protagonist of the Bible. God is. You're not the central character of the Bible. God is. God works. God acts. God chooses. God commands. God seeks. God redeems. God, God, God. If someone asks you what the Bible is about, you can tell them pretty simply, it's definitely not about me. It's about God. It's about what God has done for man's good and for his glory. God is the main character of the Bible. God is the hero. And what we find in the Bible is not a total abandonment of humanity. God has not retired his presence infinitely. On the contrary, according to God's plan, what we see in redemption is God's progressive presence. We see God give his presence progressively to his people. So in Genesis 12, God chooses Abraham. And once again, God establishes his covenants. But this covenant is different. God promises that he will bless Abraham with a family, and through this family, God will bless all the other families of the world. God is promising that he's going to give his perfect presence to one family, to Abraham's family. And Abraham's family now belongs to God, and God gives them a sign, and the sign that he gives them is circumcision, and this simply is a sign that points to the fact that they belong to God's family. They are part of the people who belong to God. And throughout the entire Old Testament, we see a phrase that is repeated over and over and over again like a drum that we just can't ignore. And the first time we hear it is in Genesis 17, verse 8. 
In Genesis 17, sorry, verse 7, it says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. The promise that God makes to Abraham is that he will be the God of Abraham's family. God would give to Abraham and his family his complete presence just like he did with Adam. Abraham's family becomes Israel, named after Abraham's grandson, Israel. And over the course of the book of Genesis, Abraham's family grows and grows. They end up living in Egypt. They're taken captive by Egypt. And at this point in the book of Genesis, God's presence has only been with a specific few people. It's only been with these specific patriarchs. It's been with Abraham. It's been with uh, with his son Isaac. It's been with his son Jacob. But all of that changes in the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus... God is being faithful to the promise that he made to Abraham that he would rescue Abraham's family from the captivity in Egypt. And so we know God sends the ten plagues and God redeems and rescues the people of Israel from Egypt. And he says the following to Moses in Exodus chapter 6. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. God frees the people of Israel from Egypt. And to guide them into the promised land, we see something amazing in Exodus 33, 14. In Exodus 33, 14, God is speaking. He said, my presence will go with you. God gives Moses and the people of Israel his presence. And he gives it to them in a temporal way. If you remember, they built a tabernacle. And in this tabernacle, God's presence descended, and this is what would lead the people of Israel into the the promised land. So during the day, it was a giant cloud. During the night, it was a big pillar of fire. But not only that, God also gave them the law, and this law represented God's holiness. And so that they could be able to go in and be with God in his presence, they had to obey his law. And part of his law specifically dealt with the great impediment that kept them from being in God's presence. What was the impediment? Sin. And so God laid out an entire system for them to be able to atone for their sins. They had to shed blood, blood of perfect animals. And we see this laid out in the book of Leviticus. In Leviticus chapter 26, verses 9 to 12, notice what God says, I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and will confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat old store long kept and you shall clear out the old to make way for the new. And then he says... I will make my dwelling among you. My soul will not abhor you. I will mock, walk among you, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. God promises again a future day when he will be among them. And they will be his people, and he will be their God. And in the prophets, we start hearing this promise about this future day more and more. And all of a sudden, this pounding beat that we hear in the background, I'll give you my presence. You will be my people. I will be your God. We start hearing it louder and louder. And in Ezekiel 37, it says, they shall not defile themselves anymore with idols or with any transgressions. I will save them in which they, I will save them from the backslidings in which they have sinned. I will cleanse them and they will be my people and I will be their God. A few verses later, he says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It'll be an everlasting covenant, and I will set them in their their land and multiply them. My dwelling place will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. There's this consistent promise that God's going to do something about the impediment that exists between man and his perfect presence. There's this consistent promise that God is going to do something. And then we start hearing in the prophets that God's going to do this through someone in particular. We start hearing about how God's going to send a prophet that's better than Moses. God's going to send a king that's better than David. God's going to send a priest that's better than Aaron. God's going to send a sacrifice that's better than the thousands upon thousands of sacrifices that the people of Israel have shed the blood of. So we see in Jeremiah 30, 21 to 22, their prince shall be one of themselves. Their ruler shall come out from their midst. I will make him draw near. He will approach me. For who would dare of himself to approach me, declares the Lord. And he says, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. 
Or the, the famous passage, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. I know it's not Christmas, but I think we can read it. Yeah? For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And what's interesting is that other passages... This promised prince of peace, this promised king, will also be a suffering servant. He will destroy sin and the penalty of sin forever so that Abraham's family can be in God's presence forever. Throughout the entire Old Testament, we see how God is promising this future day where he's going to give more and more of his presence. But then the Old Testament ends. And you and me, we, we just turn the page, and we start Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. But I don't know if you know this. There are 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And during those 400 years, God is silent. And the first voice that we hear. I mean, could you imagine generations have passed waiting for God to fulfill his perfect promise, and the first voice that we hear after God has been silent for 400 years is an angel approaches this young girl and says, you're going to have a son, and his name will be Emmanuel. What's Emmanuel mean? God with us. All of a sudden, promises are becoming to look much more real. And what Abraham's family didn't know is that the prince of peace that God has been promising, this perfect and sovereign king, wouldn't be just anybody. It would be God in the flesh. John 1.14 says that Christ came and made his dwelling among us. The word that John uses, he tabernacled among us. He came and lived we were designed to be in and enjoy God's presence forever. And in Christ, God's presence came and dwelt among men. But not just that, we see all throughout the Gospels how Jesus is promising not just that he's going to dwell among us, but he will literally dwell in us. That God's presence would not just be something external or contained in the temple of the tabernacle, but that God's very presence will dwell in us. And Christ makes these promises not just knowing that someday they will be accomplished, but rather he makes these promises knowing that he will accomplish them. That the impediment between man and God's perfect presence has to be abolished, and Jesus makes these promises knowing that he will abolish that. So notice what the author of Hebrews says in chapter 10, 11 to 12. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. A few verses later in verse 17, God says, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. But not just that, when Christ dies on the cross, something amazing happens. If you remember the tabernacle and later the temple, there was one very, very special place. This very special place was called the Holy of Holies, and it was in this Holy of Holies that God's perfect presence and perfect glory resided. And Matthew tells us that when Jesus dies on the cross, the curtain that separated the people of God from the presence of God, what happened? Split in two. Because Jesus paid the penalty of our rebellion, we now can have access to God's perfect presence. And we see how throughout the New Testament, this presence of God among his people is progressive. Christ on the cross has done for us what Adam couldn't do. Christ on the cross has done what Abraham couldn't do. Christ on the cross did what Moses couldn't do. Christ on the cross did what David couldn't do. Christ on the cross did what the prophets couldn't do. Christ accomplished for us what we most desperately needed. 
He's offered reconciliation with God. We were made to be in and enjoy God's presence forever. And in Christ, God has given us access to his presence. But that's not all. Jesus, in the upper room discourse throughout the entire time, he keeps saying, you know what, it's better for me to go. And the reason that it's better for me to go is so that I can send my helper. And so Jesus says that he's going to send his helper, his spirit. In Acts chapter 2, we see that Jesus has ascended. He goes to be with the Father. In the day of Pentecost, God pours out his presence on his people. God pours out his presence on all those who have confessed faith in Jesus Christ. So notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 16. He says, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, and notice what he says. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Paul's quoting Leviticus 26. But we're still not done. Christ has opened direct access to the Father and Christ's and God's presence has been poured out on us by his spirit but we're still waiting for the day when we will be physically and perfectly in God's presence. And so Jesus says in John 14, 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and I'll take you there to myself that where I am you might be also. The New Testament refers to this place where we are united with God's presence as the new creation. And in this new creation, we experience once again God's perfect presence. In this new creation, we find ourselves once again in a garden. It's perfect. It is full of God's presence. And notice what the Bible says at the end of all times when we find ourselves in the new creation with Jesus in Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. <laughs> they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. This is the gospel. This is the good news. God has acted to pay the penalty of sin, to destroy it, so that we might once again be reconciled to him. Now, why do I tell you all of this? That's just the intro. We're going to jump into the sermon now. <laughs> just kidding. Lunch is happening soon, I promise. The entire world around you, the entire world around you, your neighbors, your coworkers, your family members, they're clamoring and pinching and clawing with the hopes of finding true life. Because they don't have a why, they can't face the how. And so often in the midst of the difficulty, they're just trying to find a way to soothe the pain. They're trying to find a way to make the evil go away just for a moment. So maybe if they buy more of this, or maybe if they consume more of this, or maybe if they do more of this, or maybe if they're more successful in this, they'll finally achieve the peace that they've always believed that they could have. As a society, we don't know how to face failure. We don't know how to face loss. We don't know how to face evil. We have no answers. We hate it all. We abhor it, but we don't know what to do. And most people are convinced that the problem in the world is something that isn't actually the problem. <laughs> women are convinced that men are the problem. Men are convinced that women are the problem. <laughs> right? Democrats think Republicans are the problem. Republicans think Democrats are the problem. The wealthy think the problem are the poor and welfare and government programs. The poor think the problem is the 1%. That if we could just tweak a couple of these things, we would finally reach that utopia that we've always longed for. And so individually, we stake our hope for a changed world on material things. If we could just be wealthy, get a new car, a better job, a vacation, a year without sickness. As a society, we stake our hope for a changed world on government, on political, pol on political parties, the economy, Technological advancements, but none of these things are the solution. Do you know why? 
because none of these things are the problem. There's a story of G.K. Chesterton. There was an article written in a newspaper. The title of of the article was, What's the Problem in the World? And G.K. Chesterton supposedly wrote into this newspaper a letter to the editor, and he said, Dear Sirs, I am, signed G.K. Chesterton. The world's problems don't exist because men are divided. The world's problems exist because man is separated from God. And Tim Keller says, since we were originally created for God's immediate presence, only before his face will we thrive, flourish, and achieve our highest potential. If we were to lose his presence totally, that would be hell. A lot of times when we talk about hell, we're much more concerned with the kind of physical pain and torture that'll take place. But the epitome of hell is complete and utter self-consumption. The epitome of hell is believing the serpent's lie over and over and over again that I can be like God. And what inevitably ends up happening is there comes a day where God says, all right, you belong to yourself. And you and I, we know the answer. We know how God has given in Christ the opportunity to be reconciled back to him. You and me, those who have been united to Christ in his death and in his resurrection, those of us who have been reconciled and indwelt with God's presence, we carry in us the message of the hope for the world that God's presence is accessible. And this is why we go. This is why we knock on our neighbor's door and invite them over for dinner. This is why we have conversations with our coworkers. Because despite the fact that they might look happy on the outside, until they've been reconciled to God, they're facing utter doom. And so we speak the truth of the message of Jesus Christ that Emmanuel has come and that he has assumed the penalty for our sin and he has risen from the grave conquering sin and death and he has promised that he will unite us to God and we will be in his presence forever. So C.S. Lewis says this and I'll end with this. C.S. Lewis says, there are no ordinary people You've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, culture, arts, civilizations, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it's immortals who we joke with. It's immortals who we work with, who we marry, who we snub and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. What makes the difference? The gospel. What makes the difference? Whether someone enjoys God's presence forever or remains self-consumed and self-centered eternally, what makes the difference is the gospel. And so we go and we open our mouths and we speak and we serve and we live out the implications of this message knowing that one day soon we will be reunited with our king who'll put everything in order and he'll bring to account everything and all of the pain and all of the hurt will disappear but until then we have work to do God, we pray that you would use us to speak your word, that you would use us to communicate the truth of the gospel, that you would use us to proclaim and embody the presence of King Jesus wherever we find ourselves so that you might be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.